From Interfaith Alliance, this is State of Belief Radio. I'm Interfaith Alliance President Reverend Paul Brandeis Rauschenbusch broadcasting this week from New York City. So when your heart is breaking for what another is going through, follow where your heart leads. That's resurrection working in you. Go to the places when you feel called to, to where love is needed and offer what you have. That is resurrection working in you. And wherever there is joy, celebrate and protect it, even if it's not yours. That's resurrection working in you. Be open to the people and places that help you believe that there is another realm beyond this life. And trust that when the time comes, Jesus will be there to help you cross over. But in the meantime, you are here, as am I, called to live with compassion and love. We can't do this on our own or perfectly, and, and we aren't meant to. Resurrection is God's work. And it's happening right now in all the wounded and sacred places of our lives and of this world. But we can be part of it whenever and however we choose to receive it for ourselves and then turn and offer what we can in a resurrection-shaped life. Christians around the world are celebrating Easter the holy day when believers proclaim Christ is risen and that life has triumphed over death. Today, we're talking to someone who is an authority on questions of Jesus and how a Christian might understand the hopeful message of Easter, even with all the challenges that we face in our personal lives as well as the nation. Episcopal Bishop Marion Edgar Buddy is in her 12th year of serving Washington, D.C., which has put her in the front lines of some of the most momentous events in our nation's capital. Bishop Buddy was a crucial voice in 2020 in the days after Donald Trump used smoke bombs to clear Lafayette Square and then marched to St. John's Episcopal Church for a photo op with the Bible. And I know she'll have a lot to say about Trump's recent kickoff rally in Waco, Texas. A passionate advocate for racial and economic justice, Bishop Buddy is a tireless voice for the good that organized religion can bring to society in our time and that cooperation across lines of faith can give to all of us. On this week's show, we'll explore themes of new beginnings and of hope, so tied in with the Christian celebration of Easter. You can hear State of Belief on the radio and get the podcast on Apple Podcasts and all the other podcast platforms. Every week, I'm in the conversation with some of the most fascinating and impactful civic and religious leaders across the nation. Please subscribe today. State of Belief Radio is made possible in great part by the generous support of our listeners. If you've made a donation, thank you for helping get these conversations heard by more people who need them. If you haven't pitched in yet, information on how you can help keep this show on the air is available at stateofbelief.com. And you can find out more about the work of Interfaith Alliance and join us at interfaithalliance.org. And now to my guest. Since 2011, Bishop Marianne Edgar Buddy has led the Episcopal Diocese of Washington, D.C., the first woman to do so. Bishop Buddy is also the chair and president of the Protestant Episcopal Cathedral Foundation. Her books include Receiving Jesus, The Way of Love in 2019, and coming this May, we have a new book from Bishop Buddy, which is How We Learn to Be Brave, Decisive Moments in Life and Faith. Boy, do we need that. Bishop Buddy, welcome back to State of Belief Radio. It's such an honor to speak with you. It's wonderful to be with you, Paul. Thank you for the invitation. Well, It is Easter time, and we are celebrating this moment that is difficult for many of us in our personal lives and and certainly in our collective national life and and globally as well. And so I'm turning to you for some Easter good news. Uh, uh, how, how How do we celebrate this time for Christians 
in in the face of a, a lot of shadows uh, that are that are around us, how, how do you do that personally? And what message do you have for um, Christians and also uh, neighbors of Christians around the country? Um, you know, it is it is exactly what you said. It is good news in the face of shadows, which is the message of Easter as it from the very beginning. And so one of the things to remember when we celebrate Easter is that it is the culmination of a whole series of commemorations that walk us through um, through the life of Jesus and that of his followers, walk us through really the worst things that can happen, the worst things that can happen to an individual, the worst thing that can happen to a community of people, the worst things that can happen to a nation. And there's no holding back, there's no uh, glossing over the nature of grief, of betrayal, suffering, uh, political oppression, everything that we might bring to this moment from our own lives is embedded in the Easter story. And so when we get to the mystery and the promise and the and the life affirming reality of resurrection it's not a it's not an easter bunny in your basket kind of celebration ah. it is it is life rising up from the ashes of death and so depending on where we are in that spectrum of the death to life emerging process we can find a part of the story that it speaks to us and then as as you were saying as we look out over the 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 public, the global, certainly the relational world, no matter what we're experiencing, we can also find something that can guide us through what's happening around us and to other people in such a way that we can live with greater joy and hope and courage even in the even in the hardest of times. So mm. I I you know I it's, it, Proclaiming Easter is never easy because you have to go to where Easter starts, which is in a death experience. But if you have to go through a death experience, and frankly, all of us do multiple times as we live, and then, of course, the final death when we cross over from this life, when we're there, the resurrection story and the power of what Jesus represents for us is what we've got to hold on to. And the Mm. people and speak most definitively about that experience are the ones who've gone through it. And that's why their message is so powerful and why we hang on to it when we're hoping for the same in our lives. Right? Yeah. I think you just said it so beautifully. It, and part of what I, you know, in, in my own faith try to hold on to is just that it's a hopeful story, but it's not an easy story. And right. it recognizes also just a compassionate story of like other people going through it. And you find yourself in, in different moments of your life, in different <laughs> stages of the Easter story. And I, I love that. And this message of hope, which is not Pollyanna, and that there's a lot of sojourning through the shadows that that may have to happen, but an invitation towards life, towards joy, and almost an insistence on it. I, I feel very grateful for you to be offering us that message today and on all of our listeners from whatever tradition we happen to be a part of. I think the other thing that for this year, for this time in particular, um, one of the gifts of the what in the sort of the liturgical traditions we call Passion Week or Holy Week, culminating in Easter, is that if you if you pay attention and if you delve into the story, you're given an image of Jesus that is so compelling and so different from the caricatures we see and hear of him. I mean, here is a man of such profound courage and love and commitment to nonviolence and a, a willingness to go to the depths of darkness and not condemn those who fail him along the way. And of course, almost everybody does, right? And yet he does not condemn. He he walks to the end, um, even when it wasn't always clear if that's that was his choice, right? I mean, he asked, 
like so many of us would to be spared. And yet he, he carries forth, he does what he believes God is calling him to do. He surrenders when he feels as if the powers of darkness have it for a time to prevail, trusting that the goodness and the light and the love of God will in fact have the final word. And so I think, you know, for those of us who are trying to live a Christian life in a time when um, even the word Christian can be suspect because of so many ways that it's the witness is abused. I feel like this season, most of all, gives us really strong, gr solid ground to stand on, to be mm -hmm. proud, to follow this man and to follow his light and his love and his message in the world. Um, mm -hmm. and when when yeah. we have to, to pay our price, um, but knowing it's nothing compared to the price that that he pays and that so many around the world pay for their witness. I do think like as Christians right now, especially with the rise of Christian nationalism and the, the rise of the abuse of uh, identity to kind of impose a certain slice of a tradition, which is not actually even the majority of those Christians, but they want to impose their morality, anti-trans, anti-gay, anti, you know, anti-women, all these things, you know, that it, it is important that we kind of recognize the depth of our own tradition and also speak out. I mean, one of the things that I think is, is worth just pausing to mention is that often Holy Week, especially uh, what we call Good Friday, uh, created moments of terrible anti-Jewish violence because people were saying, oh, the Jews killed Jesus, which, of course, is not the, 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 the story. Um, but it was and then all of a sudden, Jews who are already an oppressed minority in every location they lived in had to receive like, violence because of that. And so I've been in I've been in situations in churches where they they just weren't like cognizant of the liturgy in right. a way that made it clear that, you know, this is not a, the problem was not Jewish people. Right. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm sure you've thought about that. And, oh, and I, I, yeah, I think about it all the time. And um, and I've done um, uh, we do have some things to answer for in our tradition that encourage that kind of anti-Jewish um, thinking. I mean, I was just reading in the text um, this, this morning and there are references in the text themselves to the Jews as if they were a separate group of people from Jesus, right? As if Jesus and his followers were not Jewish. And that dichotomy, which represents a heartbreaking um, separation of the followers of Jesus from their synagogues and from their from their people in those early early years, um, that 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 separation has been extrapolated and misapplied throughout millennia, as you describe. And as we try to come to terms with that and to have, I mean, another posture I think is incredibly appropriate for us as Christians is humility and an openness to see how where in our tradition we have in fact replicated the very sins that Jesus dedicated his life to addressing that mm. we have become we ha we we risk some of the very same tendencies that um that are against life and against the very message he proclaimed so all of that that internal reckoning and soul searching is part of what it means to be a christian now uh, for the very reasons you've described. Yeah. And, Thank you so uh, much. And it's so important for people to hear from a bishop who's really, you know, uh, has really thought deeply about this, that this is a concern for the church. This is something that we still mm -hmm. have to be working on, especially in this moment of rising anti-Semitism. There's really no excuse for, you know, frankly, any church to not make it very plain that this there's no room for right. anti-Jewish rhetoric in our liturgies and in our sermons or anything like that. I think it's very helpful to have um, ha have someone of your station talk in, the, in this way. And I'm, and I'm not unique in that, Paul. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a growing realization. And, and fortunately, we have amazing conversation partners across the interfaith spectrum. I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Amy Jill Levine. She's a New Testament scholar. Yes. Orthodox Jew who has dedicated her life to the teachings of the of the Christian scriptures and the and the writings of Jesus and and she herself has written a book about 
uh, about so many things, but about the very week that we're describing. And one of the correctives that she that she gives us, which I find so helpful, is she looks at all of the places where we are tempted by this by the texts to to look at Jesus and adversaries as if they were categorically evil, right? Like all the Pharisees, the Sadducees, Caiaphas, the high priest, all of these people. And she puts their lives and their their work in a context that doesn't take away the tension that Jesus created when he came, but it doesn't set them up to be demonic, right? Mm. And nor does it nor does it give Jesus's followers carte blanche to treat them as such. Mm-hmm. So I want to take us back a couple years to kind of a, a low point, I think, in our nation's history when then President Trump used yeah. smoke bombs to clear Lafayette Square, marching over there, used uh, St. John's Church as a backdrop uh, as a prop almost and held up a Bible awkwardly. And um, basically like it was like a strong man using religion to reinforce his kind of authority. Uh, Very, very old trick of authoritarianism to using religion, showing force, law and order and, and religion. And I think this must have affected you quite personally because, you know, the church he was standing in front of was an Episcopal church, not necessarily a place that Trump frequented or could claim his own. We're in another, unfortunately, we're in for it uh, for another 18 months or so where we're going to be going through a campaign where there's going to be a kind of a Trumpian approach to religion and law and order and all these these kind of words. First of all, t- take us back to that experience for you and how you were feeling and some of, you know, your reaction. And then let's talk about like how you're feeling today. Well, those were um those were really terrible days. This was right in the wake of George Floyd's murder in, murder in Minneapolis and the um, the kind of electric um, current that swept through the country as, uh, as a result of that, starting in Minneapolis and moving quickly across the country, came to Washington on, um, on the weekend of, um, I think it was June 1st, and, um, and it was it was both inspiring and it was also um it was just the the range of emotions was just so um so intense what was inspiring was the movement of people what was intense was the grief and the anger the sense of outrage and um so i think all of us myself included we were we were scared we were uh we were determined to do or say something, and um, and there was this, there was this, it was just this moment, and into that moment, uh, the former president chose uh, not to be a a calming presence or a unifying presence, but instead he chose, as sadly was characteristic of him then and now, to escalate the tension, to um, throw, to do whatever he could to. Um, it seemed to make it worse rather than better. And he had just finished a scathing press conference with the uh, mayors across the city in which he was telling them all that they looked like fools and that if he needed to, he would send in the, he would send in the armed forces to bring peace to the cities, which, which I was watching on my television. And I just, I just couldn't believe what I was hearing. Um, And then as you described, he, Set across to across Lafayette Square Park and did what you described in front of in front of St. John's. I I don't I don't even remember what I was feeling when all that was happening, except I knew that he couldn't have the final word that day. I I wish I could say that I got to that conclusion all by myself, but actually it was like my phone just lit up. People were texting and calling me from around the city, around the country 
the rector happened to be out of town. I just asked somebody to put me in touch with somebody who could get a voice out there. Um, and so it happened and it, and I think it just touched a nerve. You know, I've, I've spoken out on lots of things, Paul, in the past and nobody even noticed. And this happened to be one where um, the horror was so, uh, was so widespread that people were just grateful that he didn't have the final word that night. And I would say your, your assessment is accurate. He was using the mantle of religious symbolism and authority to extend his own authority. Um, and I think he was also trying to send a message to some of the people that he would consider his base in the, in the, in the religious world. And I honestly think he and his advisors were surprised but my, by my reaction. I don't think they were anticipating it. And uh, they, was, they were expecting a different message, um, a different or no message at all. Because I don't know if you remember, but St. John's had been the um, had been the site of a very minor bit of arson the night before. So the first headline was is that St. John's had been um, had been and experienced a bit of arson the night before, which we decided very quickly we were not going to focus on. Nobody was hurt. The fire was put out quickly. We didn't want, uh, you know, just a petty act of stupidness to take away from what was a largely nonviolent movement. But I think he was trying to, I think they were trying to say something using religion. And um, and I I and so many others felt like, no, that's that's not that's not what religion is for. And yeah. not, that is not the spiritual message that our tradition wants to convey to the country. And maybe that goes back to what we were talking about, about Easter and Holy Week, that there are all kinds of messages that you can take from our scriptures, some of which are life-giving, others which are less so. There are, there are tr- strains of Christianity that frankly, serve the human human condition and the human spirit and others that sadly have worked against it. And somehow, you know, we have to take our stand as Christians. Um, and we also have to claim the part of the tradition that we feel is most authentic to Jesus and, and, um, and to be self-critical of the parts that are not, right? Um, and I feel like in that moment, um, some of us had to step into that religious space and claim a different vision um, for of Jesus's work in the world and in this country than what um, those who have been allied with the president, the former president were conveying. Yeah. Um, I think that this is, this is like where that was a moment that I actually think was um, a historic moment because it was, it was when, you know, him uh, holding up a Bible trying to say like I'm protecting St. John's Church I'm protecting the church writ large I'm protecting Christian America you know I'm and and he often uses the terms like I'm the only one who can protect you I'm the, and, and and then and then there's many many unfortunately I mean it's it's largely a white sort of conservative um, uh, base uh, who are Christians who say oh yeah you're like you're the savior and and Whereas, you know, I, I think what was so important about what your intervention there was saying, no, no, actually, Jesus is the savior. Jesus is nonviolent. Jesus is with the, you know, the protesters who are trying to, uh, you know, create uh, racial uh, equity and, and justice in this terrible moment. And so it's just a really it was really I think that I want to thank you um, for your know, courage in that moment. And, and also, you know, speaking out because now we're, we're go we're about to go into it again. More with Bishop Mary and Buddy is coming right up. If you miss any part of today's program, you can hear full episodes of State of Belief anytime on our website. You'll also find links to the topics we discussed this week, extended interviews and transcripts, and an archive of past shows, all at stateofbelief.com. You're listening to State of Leaf Radio, where religion and democracy meet. Did you happen to see any of the clips or or his rally in Waco, Texas, where they were they were literally creating a ritual out of January sixth, uh, you know, right. uprising. You know, the ple- kind of the pledge of allegiance. I mean, the irony of the whole thing. You know, and and while like the insurrection is happening, and then you know, 
religion is undergirding this. And I guess I'm, I'm curious how you deal with this. Uh, you know, you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm a rabble, you know, just like rabble rousing Baptist out there, you know, you're, you're like an Episcopal bishop. Like, what do you do with this kind of a moment in our history where there's like a, there's going to be a real wrestling around religion and how do we speak out to it in a way that doesn't, so that we don't become what we hate but that we name what we see. We name what we see. And so I, I'm curious, do you have a, is there a game plan? <laughs> or what, you know, what do you have, what do you have in mind over the next 18 months where obviously you're not a pack, you know, you're not, you're not part of the political, you know, um, groove, but, but we, we also need to say what we see. Right. Um, it's a really good question. Um, I don't know that I don't have I don't know that I have a plan, um, but I do I do have principles and um, and I and I also pay attention to um, what I would consider uh, different vocations um, across the spectrum of the society when it comes to who who's called to do what right um, and and I feel like in my position I want to reserve. Um, I want to be. I want to be in those places where, um, on those few occasions, when the voice of one bishop of a pretty small denomination that happens to have some spiritual symbolism and authority, that if I if I if I put my oar in the water, then in conjunction with a lot of other people who are doing the same, we might actually move something forward. Right. Um, and so I'm no longer, when I was younger and I was a priest, and even before that, when I was an organizer, I was more out on the edge, kind of pushing things and kind of taking taking things more to the streets, if you will, or hardcore kind of community organizing or advocating, or lobbying. And I don't do that anymore, not because I don't think it's important, but because I don't think that's the best use of my role right now. And so I try to create as many relationships as I can across a broad spectrum of points of view, um, both political and spiritual, so that when I do speak on a moral issue or a divisive issue. People hear me and they know that um, I'm willing and I'm willing to listen and be a part of a conversation that encompasses a lot of different perspectives because I feel like some of us need to stay there if this country is going to, if this country is going to survive. Yeah. Even even if that means I, 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 I disappoint a lot of people whose, whose opinions mean a lot to me because I agree with what they're doing and I support what they're doing. But where I am in my work, I feel like I need a different vantage point. I mean, you may remember, I don't know if you do, but I, um, I took a lot of heat, as did the Washington National Cathedral when we we in, we invited President Trump, uh, President Elect Trump, to have his inaugural prayer service at the cathedral. It did not give us a lot of joy to do that, given the way he ran his campaign. But we did it because that was what we have done for every president since the cathedral was completed. Now, um, do I regret that decision, given how his presidency um, played out? You know, I actually do, but at the time. I was trying to be as bipartisan and as um, neutral as Washington National Cathedral attempts to be. And in so doing, when I would critique things then, as I did on, on June 1st, 2020, I hope I, I was I hope people hear me in a different way than someone who is just um, not just, but someone who is making political statements and critiquing in such a consistent way that there is it's almost predictable what the Bishop of Washington would say. Yeah. Does that make I, sense? I think that that, I, that makes total sense to me. I, I think that there are roles for all of us and, right. and not everyone is going to be out in front, but, but I do think that what I like is also when you do put your oar in the water and pull, it yeah. has a different sort of resonance. And I, I really appreciate that. And I appreciate the, um, 
the kind of spiritual discipline to, that goes into that, especially, you know, coming from where you come from. And I, I wanted to go there for a second because I don't think I really know that much about where you come from. Can you say a little bit about your history and, and kind of where you come from and, and like how you got into this religion racket? You know, you were like a scrappy organizer and then all of a sudden you get called you get called to the, the priesthood. So t- tell me a little bit about your background. I think it's sort of the other way around. I had I had a fairly dramatic religious conversion experience when I was a teenager, and um, and in a context where um, you know very recognizable in some of the more conservative. I don't know that I would have used those terms then, but conservative evangelical tradition, um, and um, was grateful to the people who surrounded me in those years because my family life, quite frankly, was a mess and. This was a community that enveloped me and gave me an assurance of Jesus and his love for me at a time when that was a, you know, that, that really, really meant a lot to me. Um, But it, from the beginning, even I was like 16 or 17 at the time, from the beginning, I, I had this intellectual struggle that I never gave voice to because I, I love these people, but there were just some pieces of their worldview and, and theology that, even at 16 or 17 didn't make sense to me, right? Like there was this, there was this narrow, narrow path to salvation and lucky us, we were the only ones on it. I mean, and not just Christians, but this very narrow band of Christians understanding salvation in this very particular way. Um, And I, I didn't really believe that, but I didn't know, I just didn't have the wherewithal to, to, to act on not knowing how, not struggling with that tension um, I also had a hard time with the nature of the conversion itself because, uh, frankly, I didn't feel all that converted. I didn't feel like I was all that different from the young girl who went up for that altar call and was baptized. Like I was still whatever I was supposed to feel. I I felt like other people must have had more of it because I kept on thinking, well, maybe I should keep coming back, do it again. But the message was clear. No, you don't do that again. You're 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 born again once. And so it's like, OK. Um, and then fate would have it. I wound up leaving that part of the world and that part of my family to go back and live with my mom, who was in, this was in Colorado and this was in New Jersey. And my mom had been attending an Episcopal church and she had really gotten her life together in a way that was I, I admired. Um, and uh, my church in Colorado was like, don't well, you really shouldn't join an Episcopal church because that that would just be that would not be a good path for you. And I'm thinking, yeah, I don't, I think it's, you know, it's my mom's job. I'm not going to tell my mom I can't go to her church. Right. And so I started going to that church again. I mean, I went, there was a little tiny kid. Don't remember anything about it, but anyway, um, the, the minister there and my mom and just the example of that community gave me a broader worldview and language and the sacraments gave me an understanding of, you know, you know, in the sacramental tradition, you go up to the altar every week and you bring everything you are, all your all your failings, all your hopes, your aspirations, and you lay it all there and receive the presence of Jesus. So everything about it just, I felt like, okay, I'm, I'm at home. Mm. Um, it was in college that I, I was, I think, converted again. And that was in a more social, social consciousness and political, polit- politicalization, I suppose. This was in the eighties during the Central American wars. And I was just blown away by the witness of the nuns and priests in Central America who were getting themselves killed for what right. they believed. Um, it was about the same time that I um, I delved into the work and writings of Martin Luther King. So I just had this like exploding awareness of what it meant to be a Christian in the world. And I was pretty sure that that was, I just was going to, I wanted to do something that big, that bold, that courageous. You know, I just, I just had all that fire in me. Of course, I was 22 years old and a complete wreck on so many other people. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so I had a lot of growing up to do, but, um, so long story short, I, um, I wound up working in social justice circles in my early twenties, mostly in church organizations. And, um, but the Episcopal church had a claim on my heart that I couldn't quite shake. And I, so I mustered up my courage and knocked on the door of ordination. And to my absolute amazement, I was accepted, um, and I always thought I would serve on the edges, on the margins of society, because that's where I felt called. Um, but as it turned out, I I wound up being a parish priest for 25 years and and uh, was pretty good at it. And so I always had I've always kept that social consciousness, but I've lived my vocation out in the 
in the in the parameters of Christian community um, mm. and pretty small Christian community. Honestly, I, I've done a lot of work with um, Spanish speaking cultures and I've done a lot of anti-poverty work, but it's always been in the context of of a congregation. There is something about a congregational setting that actually can be one of the most, not necessarily politically radical, but radical in the sense of like, you are welcome here. I mean, that's what got me into this racket to begin with. You know, when I when I started, when I went to seminary and went to this small Baptist church where everybody there was, was they, they, there was no question you, you're supposed to be here. You know, like whether you're homeless or or trans or, you know, or don't speak English. Everybody there was like, this is, of course, you're here. This is your church, you know, and and there's not that many places in the world where just because you're there means you're supposed to be there. And I just think like the church, when it does that, you know, when it makes people feel respected and dignified just, you know, for who they are. I mean, that's like a radical act. Uh, and the potential for that uh, is is amazing. Um, so you so 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 talk to me now about this book that's coming out. We're going to have you back in May, but I do want to get a taste. Like, what does it mean to be brave right now? Like, I, you, you've obviously spent a long time, you know, writing this book, thinking about it. Like, tell me how to tell me how I could be brave, Bishop well, Buddy. Please okay. tell me how to be brave. No. Well, but, um, what insights right. do you have? You know, what I um, I think we all want to be brave, right? We want to be, we want to be brave, and we imagine courage and those moments of bravery to be those you know those huge earth shattering times when we do the thing, right? When we do the big thing that um, that changes something or moves the mark. And I certainly write about those moments. But what I wanted to do was to normalize the those. Um, the, the countless ways that we are invited into a de- usually by a decision that we have to make um, to do something that we know as we're doing it is really important and it requires everything we've got, the majority of which are not public at all, but they're private decisions. And so they're not the kinds of things that get written up in, you know, social media or or anything. It's just these these moments. And what I so what I do is I I, I what I did was I, I I thought about, okay, let's think about all the different ways that we can be invited into a moment of courage and what that what it does to us when we as we prepare for it how we are prepared for those moments how we live through them and then how we understand our lives afterwards and so i you know so i break it down like the first one i think that we all experience because it's so developmentally appropriate is when we decide for the first time it's time for us to go to go from where we are to some place we've never been right which is obviously the hero's journey as it's been portrayed to us in literature and in mythology. It is the um, it is the leaving of home and moving into toward new horizons. Um, it's usually it's a summoning that can happen. You think of all the great stories in scripture from Abraham on forward of people just simply being summoned into into onto a journey toward a new toward a new identity and what it feels like when and you, you don't miss that moment you know when it's happening and you mm. know when you say yes and they can be large they can be small they can be um they can have they almost always have relational implications because you're leaving some people right you're leaving some people and you're moving toward what's usually another level of commitment or community so that's one then i contrast that with the moments when we actually make the opposite decision and we decide to stay that there is a um there is pressure or a longing to to escape to to do something else to um to claim some new great horizon but the the call seems to be in that moment you know what this is the time to set down roots this is the time to be present for somebody else this is the time to go deeper where you are rather than going off to the next thing, right? So you hear where I'm going with that. So yeah, yeah, I love that, actually. We we, we oh, often think, yeah. like, bravery is like, dun dun dun, dun like I have my, sh- my shield and my sword, and I'm going to go, like, trot along, you know, as a as a knight of Camelot or something like that. And exactly, rather, exactly. like, that's, 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 that is one kind. But the idea yeah. of, like, actually what's what's braver right now or, or takes more courage is not to leave. Is actually, no, it, like... I don't know if it takes more- 
Yeah, I, I don't know. It's just like it's another kind of courage. I mean, you know, it's I just another, I love the fact that it doesn't have to be always going out. It can right. be sometimes, you know, yeah. going yeah. deeper where you are, or you know, whatever it is. I I, I think that's going to be really helpful to us. I think this sounds like a great book, and okay. we're gonna we're gonna talk more about it when it comes out. One of the things I like to ask everyone who comes on this show is, like, what gives you hope right now? You're in the hope business, you know. I mean, you're. <laughs> I think people come to Bishop Buddy to, hoping for hope. They're hoping for some kind of comfort. But how do you get? How do you maintain your hope? Um, um, unevenly. Let me put it that way. I'm human. So I I go through the same fluctuations of hope and its counterparts or its opposites as anyone else. But what keeps me coming back to hope are, are several things. One, I, I I do believe that hope is a is a spiritual practice. Um, I a Rwandan man that I deeply admire, who was a peacemaker back in the days of um, the worst of the genocide. He said, "You know, hopelessness for Christians is not an option, right? I mean, we don't we don't get to stay hopeless if we're going to follow Jesus. So there is there's a choice to be made about hope. But having said that, you can't just gird yourself up all the time, right? You need genuine sources of hope. And those come to me in in in, in those grace-filled encounters, be it with God in a private moment or in most often through the inspiration of other people, that I see something, I see something that says, there's a choice to be made here. Are you going to be on the side of hope or on the side of despair? Because there's Every, you know, there's absolutely all kinds of justi justification in the world not to have hope, right? But there are those invitations and those moments and those people who say, I'm going to live a different way. I'm going to live as if the good is possible. I'm going to live as if we can actually make a difference. I'm going to live as if my contribution matters. Um, and um, and that's what I that's what I hold on to. I I, I feel it is as much a gift when I'm given hope as it is a discipline, but it is also something that I pray for, I ask for. Um, it is something I look for. Um, I try not to, um, I try to be careful about the things I, I consume, you know, in terms of what goes into my spirit, because I need to be, I need to be constantly reminded of the good. And so I try to take that in, um, in as many ways as I can, and to be surrounded by people, both through literature or, um, you know, through education, or just by the people that I, I, I socialize with that are hope bearers, so that they rub mm -hmm. off on me, and I can be yeah. a hope, right? Well, it's, you know? it, it, it's yeah. I love, it made me think that like hope is an activity rather yeah. than a commodity. Yes, thank you. That's really well said. Yeah, um, it, it, you know, it's really it's all you know. It's like a verb rather than a noun. It's like some. It, it is like it really isn't a static idea, um, but rather, right. a, you know, it, uh, you, you started off with like a discipline. So that's I, this is this is a well, very, it's, and it's, it, it takes no energy at all to be negative, right? Take, and uh, yeah. No, yeah, none whatsoever <laughs> to be to be cynical, right? Yeah, Not, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it, it, especially you, you know especially the world we're surrounded in right now. Like that's very, very natural and understandable. However, uh, we, 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 uh, we, we also have to move forward. Right, I'm curious, is there anybody who I've never heard of or our <laughs> listeners who are, have probably never heard of who you have interacted with, who you're just like, Oh God, that was good. You know, like, you know, that, you know, the, the, someone who in your life who has really helped shape you, who you want to lift up right now, you know, who you think is, you know, one of those spiritual teachers who's never going to make the papers, but who is worthwhile mentioning in this moment. Oh, my goodness. So many, so many, Paul. But let me tell you about a woman I had breakfast with today. Um, she called me. Um, she and her daughter were in town and wondered if we could meet. Her name is Carol Kramer. Um, she's an Ojibwe woman um, from uh, northern Minnesota. 
I met her because um, she and her husband, who was a uh, a, a, an Episcopal priest who was serving in one of the towns uh, in Minnesota. They married when they were young and they were serving in a church in Iowa. Um, but she was the adopted grandmother of a young man in the parish I served. And through him and his uh, tragic and untimely death, she and I became um, she and I became good friends. And so here's a woman, she's 86 years old, just a sparkle of joy and life and energy. Um, she grew up on the reservation. She has she taught sixth grade and seventh grade middle school in Iowa. And she was telling me this morning that she was doing um, anti-racism training and consciousness raising in middle school back in the 70s, right? And she was just determined. And, and what I loved about her, and we talked about her mother who was of course part of the boarding school generation. And we were talking about her life in Iowa. And all I can say is that people like Carol are everywhere. They're mm. everywhere. People who have lived beautiful, um, hard lives, but they have kept their sense of not only of vitality, but of life worth living. And so when I'm when I'm in the presence of a woman like Carol, I I feel not only um, not not only hope and joy, but a, a kind of resolve that you know, okay, that's that's a window of how I want to live when I'm 86 years old, which you know isn't that far away. But it's you know it's that it's that sense. So I guess I would say we all have people like that. And yes, there are the beacons that shine really brightly, and you and I could tick off a dozen without batting an eye. But there are also these people all around us that are those people for us. And I write about several of them in my book because I think we all need those um, light bearers. And those hope bearers, and um, and if we look around, um, we will find them. And that, you know, going back to the whole celebration of Easter, I mean, that is that's how the that's how the faith is handed on. It's not handed on by um, by by reading a book. It's handed down person by person. Um, faith is caught, and it's caught by people. Um, it's caught from the people who have embodied it in their lives in such a way that you know that they believe what they believe and they live by it and they make you want to live by it too. Bishop Mary and Buddy, thank you so much for being with us today on State of Belief Radio. What a blessing. Thank you, Paul. Really wonderful to be with you. Take good care. And with that, I'm afraid that's all the time we have for this week's show. We need your help keeping this show on the air. I hope you'll consider being a partner in this crucial work by making a financial contribution today. Information on how to donate is available at stateofbelief.com. That's stateofbelief.com. And you can also be part of making sure informative and encouraging voices like this are heard by sharing this program with friends and family. Let's get more people listening and more people taking part in these conversations, both on and off the air. Never miss an episode by subscribing to the weekly State of Belief podcast on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. And join the conversation. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter at State of Belief and share State of Belief with the people in your life. State of Belief is produced by Ray Kirstein and is a production of Interfaith Alliance. Become a member today at interfaithalliance.org. And be sure to join us next week. Until then, I'm Paul Rauschenbusch on the State of Belief, where religion and democracy meet.